Hey, Carol. Hey, Robert. How you doing? Oh, I'm doing just great. I'm just thrilled to uh, have a chance to uh, finally talk to you, talk a little bit about your channel, all the wonderful things you're doing. Okay. And the readings that you're doing. And if you want to do any more reading of, uh, you know, like what you did with Irene Yez, and about what you've done with the Book of Enoch and all the parallels and stuff, because... You know, I think you've gotten a lot of really positive attention for that, and I think it's good for people to see that a lot of people are working on this, and that you know that you're investing your time and your energy in doing all of this, which is commendable, no doubt. But this is useful information that you're providing the people with. Okay, I started out my channel, had never intended on uploading a video. I just wanted to respond to a video that I'd seen. I wanted to make a comment on it. So in order to do that, you have to become a member of YouTube. <laughs> so I did that and went ahead and made a comment on a video and some time went by and I made some friends and I kind of enjoyed the, the fellowship. I found some like-minded believers and that sort of thing. And so then I had to choose an icon, you know, because you start out at first and it's just like a blank, silhouette and I chose the pump which the pump is a tool or a catalyst that puts forth water mm -hmm. and I saw myself as a person who was putting forth the word of God which I equate the water with the word and so that just seemed like the perfect icon and because I chose my name in his word and it had already been taken, so I chose in his word, too, because you have to put a number or something back behind it. You know, I had just come out of uh, two years of very intensive study of the word of God. I'd really gotten to know just who I was serving. I wasn't taking any man's word for it. If a question came up, I got out the Strong's, I got out the Bible, I searched the scriptures, and, and I allowed the Holy Spirit to teach me the Word of God. I did not go to pastors or priests or anyone else. Mm -hmm. And through that, I, I believe I, I had a very firm foundation of the faith because I learned from the author of the faith. You know? No, I didn't uh, learn what a man thought about it. Right, and then ultimately that's the real revelation I guess about it is that you know there there's a whole social aspect to the church and to Christendom but it really always boils down to the individual you know do you believe and do you have faith? right and regardless of what you may espouse and regardless of what you may or may not do ultimately it really all comes down to you and the voice that you were following the standard which you were using was just to get to the truth and to find out the truth, whatever the truth may be, using the scriptures, the word of God, as your guide, which is uh, the same as saying, really, as using uh, Jesus or Yeshua as your guide, to become one with him and his word. So, yeah, a, a lot of the things that you've done on your channel, some of the highlights, I think, for me, um, have been your readings of various texts. I know that a long time ago you did uh, something which was very, very popular and very useful to a lot of people, and that was your Book of Enoch uh, exposed series or revealed, where you showed just how all pervasive you showed, you demonstrated the parallels between the New Testament and the Book of Enoch the influence of this document has been on the New Testament. Because, again, it, it's one of those things that, you know, you, you asked earlier just why weren't people telling you things and why weren't people showing you things. And the more you sort of dig around and the more you sort of poke around at it, the more you realize just how cut off from facts and documents and things that you tend to be once you get into a church environment, because people in a church environment are, you know, however much they may reach out to a community or whatever, or something sort of insular, 
and something sort of self-contained. And so you kind of lose a sense of the scriptures because it's sort of bound up in an aura, if you will, or a, you know, a milieu, if you will, of churchianity as opposed to the, the pure word, which is what you're about. You're about getting at the word. What does the word actually say? You know, what, where does it actually come from? And getting down into the real nitty and the gritty of it, the, the actual fact-finding mission that any true search for truth would necessitate. Because you always have to sort of wake up, become aware of the fact that you're called to something a little different and something a little bit higher. Then you just start following that voice. And it, it's amazing how many people I've spoken with have come to largely the same conclusions as I have, largely the same conclusions as you have, you know, that we are sort of being shepherded by these false shepherds and, you know, used for their ends and things are covered up and, you know, everything's real sugar-coated and cut and dried and everything, but it's just not satisfying to the soul that's really seeking. It's like our souls, if, when we're in church, and, and believe me, I've, I've had my go with that. I was a youth leader for a time. I was in the choir, very, very involved with the church, but I was starving spiritually. I was not being taught. I was being taught some really odd stuff, like if you don't do this, God won't bless you. Uh, the devil's going to get you. It was a very fear-filled church. Um, not, not good. Nonetheless, I, I had to exit out of the church system, and I never could understand why I wasn't getting it, why I wasn't getting this personal relationship with Jesus Christ, but I have the answer now. The answer is you have to delve into the Word of God. You have to search it out. You have to study it. You have to pray and ask Jesus to reveal the truth to you of what he's saying, and he will do it. Well, in a sense, he has done it. When you're talking about his word, it's there, it's written, it's fixed in stone. He calls the end from the beginning. And he does provide a gradual revelation of things, of scriptures as needed, as necessary. But a lot of the confusion and a lot of the difficulties that Christians have in my opinion, anyway, is very unnecessary because of the way in which, in, in a way to follow the church, the truth, I mean, and to adhere to the truth is something that so many people that at least I have met uh, have stumbled across this realization, and yet there seems to be this very real disconnect between people who have an awareness of just how we're being misled by these institutions and how they themselves are misled in turn that we're able to articulate certain things and yet still not penetrate to the darkness I guess that surrounds the people in terms of their belief because everything is shrouded I think in terms of partial belief and partial disbelief people tend to sit on the fence when it comes to certain things within the word like, there's certain things that are within the Word, like like the quote of the Book of Enoch and everything, and it's just a really simple thing to just go with the premise that Jude knows what he's talking about and that he's accurately quoting a source that he believes in, and yet church tradition finds that very inconvenient. And yet you, you have this scripture that you're supposed to not negate and that you're supposed to stand on, and yet you're sort of supposed to just kind of shut your eyes at certain places. Hi. And that's the problem, is that if you just follow it in terms of what it says, it really reveals to you everything. And you have to actually try and negate things in order to um, not see them. And the, the number of educated people out there, you know, who can read over these 2,000 years or whatever, the kinds of ways in which they've, I think, intentionally misled us. I mean, for example, the book was banned and burned and destroyed among a great many others, not because they were not believed, but because they were believed. 
because they were accepted. And, and so from the very beginning, you have this opposition to certain early groups of believers that somehow the church found imperative to silence and to be able to, at the end of this age, to sort of crack the door a bit into some of the hidden meanings is in a way to look back across time to see what the original beliefs were and the ways in which they were subverted and why. And that some of these mysteries are beginning to come to our awareness. Uh, and I know you wanted to talk about the parables. For example, the way in which Jesus, the Logos, Yeshua, represents the word metaphorically. And, right. Uh, and, um, you know, just the way in which that all serves as a greater key or a greater way of understanding just what the significance of what it was that he did in the flesh was as regards higher level meanings and higher level understandings that you're able to understand and to articulate, you know, and, and hopefully to lay before the people in terms of things that they can understand so that they can see what you have come to see and that more people will come to see it and that there be something like, you know, a revolution of thought uh, in Christianity that would return us to our original way of seeing the truth without the 2,000 years of distortion and distraction getting in the way of that. Well, I think it's in Hosea that talks about the two days and then in the third day he'll raise us up. And I can't pinpoint the exact date or anything when this, when this understanding came to me, but one day I just saw the word as being crucified and persecuted and, and going through the scourgings and the beatings and the burnings and everything that Jesus Christ showed us in the flesh. Which is very interesting because that was kind of why I wanted to bring this up. Because, see, you saw that independently, on your own and of yourself. And right. the, the, the interesting thing was, and that was what really resonated with me, was because I also saw that connection on my own and, you know, wow. of myself. And, you know, it was something that was very intuitively obvious to me after having thought about it. And by the way, the verse you're talking about is Hosea 6.2. It says, after two days he will revive us, and in the third day he will raise us up, and we shall live in his sight. And in the same way, this is the correspondence to his days in being buried, and he was raised on the third day, and how we are raised with him. So his resurrection is our resurrection, and that these days are spiritual days. You. Right. It's just, wow. Right. You know, it, it all comes together, and it's like this this picture image in your mind, and then you you can just see it all, and it's like, wow. This, we're entering the third day. That's why all the texts are coming out. That's why, why everybody's being able to see and hear and read these, these texts that have been buried. Mm -hmm. basically buried in archive, in the Vatican, wherever, buried from our sight, and now it's being resurrected. We're seeing the, the actual, literal, physical, spiritual, all of it, resurrection of the Word of God, but in a whole new way, because we're entering a new third day, a spiritual third day. Right, and, that, and that's important also with regards to this particular paradigm, too, and that is to say that what you're looking at in, in the Bible, what you're looking at in the scriptures are stories, they are events which have taken place in the physical realm, but that each and every one of these physical events or these physical objects or you know, healings or whatever, that they carry with them a higher, deeper meaning. A day just isn't a day. A day represents a, a period of time, for example, that it says in Second Peter that a day is as a thousand years and a thousand years are as a day. So when he says that after two days, he means after two thousand years. 
And what you get when you start reading the broader scriptures, you start reading the church fathers or you start reading the New Testament Apocrypha, you'll find in a book like Barnabas, for example, where it specifically states that the six days of creation are 6,000 years and that exactly. the seventh day or the millennium is the 1,000 years after uh, the day of rest or God's true Sabbath, right? And so right. You, you get some confirmation that those in the early church believed these ways and that these ways, you know, the first example would be like, for example, how Barnabas was labeled as spurious and that even though it exists right. in Codex Sinaiticus and potentially may have existed in other biblical codices, that it was eventually marginalized and dispensed with and the teaching done away with. Right. The way in which they would accomplish something like that would be to label it and to marginalize it and to take it out of the church, to condemn it, to whatever, and eventually anyone who reads it or, you know, teaches from it as though it were scripture is labeled a heretic. And, exactly. you know, so you have to fall in line with what the church tells you to do. But, you see, those ways are um, by, by way of force or by way of decree. Manipulation. Well, but, but rather than by way of truth. I mean, uh, right. truth is something, for example, if I say that one plus one equals two, you know, there's no way you can get away from that reality. When did it start to equal two? When will it stop equaling two? It's just something that cannot, there's no beginning to it. There's no ending to it. Just is true. And the only way you can say that one plus one equals three and get away with it is either that you can somehow convince people that that's the case, or you can do it with the edge of the sword and make it so they can't say otherwise. There was a lot of that went on. There was the burning of the scriptures. There was the Inquisition. There was a lot of that. You believe like we tell you to believe or you die. It was coercion. It was forced. And sad to say, but there's a lot of ministries out there still doing it. Still coercion. Still forcing people to do what inside they just, they're just not real comfortable with, but because they want someone to lead them. Mm -hmm. You know, they choose a man to lead them instead of Christ, which is, which is where they get into bondage. You have to follow Christ and him only and not let a man tell you what Jesus Christ said. Let Jesus tell you. Again, getting back to what you were mentioning earlier about how you saw the paradigm between the resurrection of Jesus the man and the resurrection of Jesus the word, uh, I know that you mentioned to me that you were surprised at seeing this also in the Acts of John. I was because I had not read the book yet, and I heard a little clip of it in your Passions video, and I was, I was like, wow, that's what I was trying to tell Robert the other day, and it's right there. Oh, wow. See, and that, that's, that's another example of the way in which I feel like there's independent confirmation, not only in the fact that that was something that I intuited before I read it in an ancient document, right? But the uh, fact that another person, someone that I knew personally, would come across the same intuition in and of themselves and also run across it somewhat serendipitously as you did, in exactly the same way as it's happened to me. To me, that is further confirmation that this is happening in other people. And if it can happen right. to me, and if it can happen to you, it can happen to anyone. You can gain this insight that everything on the level of the flesh carries with it this higher level spiritual meaning. And thus, everything that is earthly has a heavenly correspondence. Or, alternatively, you could say everything that is heavenly is couched in earthly terms. So if the Word, if God wanted to do something with the Word in terms of resurrecting the Logos, or the higher meaning in a Word, the way in which to accomplish it would be to come down in some form, some image, as a man in the flesh to carry with yourself the meaning of everything that you want the word itself to convey 
such that if you wish the word to be kept under earthly meaning or whatever, then the man would have to be under the earth as well. So here you need for him to be somewhat entombed or something, or dead. If the word is to be in a dead state for a certain amount of time, and this has always been your intention, then the way in which you couch that spiritual meaning is to, since you are the author of this word, that you as the author of this word, as being one with this word, come down to act, if you will, in the flesh, so that in the flesh, everything you do is according to a design that is to people's eyes and ears to a heavenly level. And so you come down with the intention of doing things in the physical that will be understood by a paradigm shift at some point from the flesh, taking your eyes somewhat off the flesh, enough to recognize the higher spiritual level meaning that those words convey such that you do gain spiritual vision and you do gain spiritual ears. And I think it's very clear from my reading of the Bible that this is what is happening here, that Jesus is, for example, if he as, is as a man healing another man, healing his eyes, his ears, or whatever, that he's doing this as an image, if you will, of the Word, as the Logos, because the Word became flesh. And right. so, therefore, if the Logos becomes flesh, if the higher meaning, therefore, takes on an earthly form, then that earthly form carries with it the whole time that spiritual meaning. And like as it says in the Gospel of Thomas, how the images, or these things that the words represent are these images, but the things that these words represent in the spiritual sense by means of conveyance, like for example, if it says in the Bible, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path, then the image is the lamp. But the light within that lamp, if you will, is the, is the word, because thy word is a lamp. See, the word is becoming fleshly. The word is becoming couched in fleshly terminology. You see, so in effect, it is also, as Thomas says, that the flesh comes about um, by means of the spirit. And he says, if the flesh comes about by means of the spirit, then that is a wonder. And then he further states that if the spirit should come about by means of the flesh, in other words, if you understand that word is couched in lamp, and then you go and you see lamp somewhere else, and then you see, oh, that means the word of God, then that's the spiritual meaning arising up out of the physical meaning. Or as Jesus says, if you don't understand the earthly things, how will you understand the heavenly things? He's basically telling you that there is a correspondence. If you understood what the earthly level meaning was, you would then understand what the spiritual level meaning was, which is completely orthodox and uh, completely within a canonical tradition. So it's something that people are, in other words, they are primed to believe and to accept. But the people in the early church, for example, condemned the Acts of John when, in fact, it's saying this very thing where Jesus is speaking to John in the uh, cave. And it says that you, hear, you heard that I suffered, yet I did not suffer, and that I was pierced, yet I was not smitten, hanged, and I was not hanged, that blood flowed from me, and it did not flow. And in a word, what they say of me, that befell me not, but what they say not, that did I suffer. And it says, now what those things are, I signify unto thee, and the word signify there is like a sign or something. I make it into a, you know, an image for you. I want you to understand. Perceive, therefore, in me the slaying of the word, or logos, the piercing of the word, the blood of the word, the wound of the word, the hanging up of the word, the suffering of the word, and the nailing and the fixing of the word, the death of the word, and so I speak, separating off manhood. In other words, he's dividing the soul from the spirit. And his word is designed to do this, that it cuts so sharp that it divides the soul from the spirit. And this is because by making everything exactly the same, in, in a sense, because everything on the er in the earthly exists in order to indicate that which is 
heavenly. In other words, he in the flesh, the word became flesh, then therefore he in the flesh is representing the word. So when, he's, when it's his blood, he's telling you it's the blood of the word. And when it's his pain, you know, and his suffering and his death, He's doing that, he's telling you that it's because of the, the fact that the word, if you will, the, the meaning of the word will be lost. And you see, and, and you, you can tell just by knowing that that has happened, and that you recognize it now after 2,000 years, that the meaning is there, that the encoding is there, and has always been there, and that nothing has changed, and that it said of itself that it would be lost. And it said of itself that it right. would be buried for two days or 2,000 years. By buried, of course, it means under earth or under the earthly terminology. In other words, earthly terminology obscures the spiritual reality. And all of these things are unlocked by these keys. By knowing that lamp means the word of God, by knowing that the church means the candlestick, as it reveals in the book of Revelation, then you know that the lamp is not meant to be put under a bushel, the word is not meant to be put up under a bushel, but to be what? Put on top of the candlestick or to be raised up by the church. So in other words, exactly. by taking those keys that are given you or by learning how to derive those keys, you can begin to uncover an entire different language that actually does exist. It's demonstrable, it can be shown, and it's consistent. And what's important also to understand is it cuts across all of these canonical boundaries. So it serves to undermine those traditions, and it serves to undermine the illusion that these false doctrines have created, that of the canonical boundary, that of the illusion or the delusion, if you will, that what has been passed down to us has come from the apostles. When you're able to, with these spiritual eyes and with these spiritual ears, actually look at what the apostles were encoding as you decode it these 2,000 years later, you understand that it had to have been their original understanding. It had to have been their original intent because here at the, on the third spiritual day, in other words, you find that he is actually raising us up with him. The right. Word. So that's confirmation. And you peer across time, and you see a verse like that, and you see, no, the early Christians were saying what I'm saying. They saw what I see. And you didn't get this from some sort of squirrely, you know, Gnostic church or Gnostic doctrine or whatever. It was something that was revealed to you directly. Right. Because if he was raised up, the logos, the meaning is raised up, then we are raised up with him. In other words, our perception is raised. Our ears are open. We, we go from the one ear of the flesh to the other ear of the spirit. So now we have two ears to hear and two eyes to see because we see on the flesh and we see in the spirit, right? And we see that the two are one and the same because the one is couched in the other. And it's, it's, our, it's our tendency to focus on the lower that keeps us from seeing the higher. But again, it's just, it's all pervasive throughout the scriptures, and it does cut across these canonical boundaries. And it is the, the unlocking of these, these words by means of the keys that allows us to do this and prove it, to demonstrate it. It'd be interesting if there was somebody out there who were willing to actually put this to the test or some kind of public forum where um, skeptics and doubters would actually take a look at it just to actually see if that is indeed the case.